My southern lingo coming out. Uh, <laughs> or actually, I, I say, how you all, but it comes out with the, how you all doing? Like, uh, <laughs> with a little bit of the New York, you talking to me? Um, <clears throat> it's a real treat uh, to be here uh, at NTC and uh, uh, to be uh, rooting my, my dog, uh, fellows on. Uh, we've, we've had, uh, a, it's just great to come out and to, uh, to uh, be with the young kids and, and experiencing this whole thing. Uh, and to be sharing with some old friends um, and getting to meet folks that I've known for a long time again and uh, listening to, to uh, new friends, uh, getting to hear Rex uh, in concert last night and then in the class today and enjoying what he had to say. Um, it's just been a really great time, so thank you very much for those that uh, thought about inviting me to come. Uh, guys, you want to have a seat? You okay? Yeah. My mind has gone in lots of different directions uh, for what today should be about. And um, I thought there was going to be some folks that I'd work with, like in a master class situation, and that, that wasn't uh, the way it was going to go. And so I, th I was trying to think of what I could talk about today. And as I say, my mind goes in lots of directions. I've, I hinted last night uh, at the journey that I've been on in the last couple of years. It has not been a pleasant journey, and I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, there's no secrets to, to that. Um, it's been an interesting couple of years for me. Um, but our God has provided, and God has uh, opened up a new avenue for me. I'm thrilled to be at the University of Georgia, um, working with uh, great brass colleagues. Brandon is here. Um, just really, um, just a, a, great, a great school. I've enjoyed working with the, my colleagues there, the environment. Love working with the kids. Uh, we've actually started, um, or, or restarted a brass band. Uh, I wouldn't get to do brass band if I was at a conservatory. They, they would look down on that kind of thing. But that's my whole background, and so it's been a really exciting thing to be part of that uh, process. Uh, it's been very, very exciting. Um, so I'm happy to chat with you about all of that, and we can do that. I'll, I'll, I'll offer opportunities for you to talk and ask questions and things like that. But the other thing that I thought about was to talk to you a little bit about uh, a talk that I gave at a class that we had at UGA called Music in the Real World. Um, and and uh, that covers a wide scope and they bring in a lot of different folk to, uh, to do that class. But they asked if I would talk about audition uh, preparation. And uh, I, I said, yeah, I'll do that. Um, the truth is I haven't had many auditions. I took uh, two auditions in my life. Um, <laughs> But I can only tell you what I did, although it was a long time ago. I sort of had to recreate the whole thing and say, now what did I do? Uh, but it was kind of interesting. But I, I started in thinking about it. I looked up some quotes, and I always love to have quotes. I guess that's the preacher in me coming out a little bit. It's always good to have somebody to quote. Alexander Graham Bell said this, before anything else, preparation is the key to success. Abraham Lincoln said, I will prepare and someday my chance will come. And Benjamin Franklin said, by failing to prepare, prepare, you're preparing to fail. And we heard a lot about that today with Rex as he was talking about uh, practice and, and improvisation and different things like that and how we prepared for a new piece. And, and a lot of us have been through that type of thing as I had to prepare for the Aaron Kernis concerto, which was the last concerto that I, that I played. Um, and a uh, brand new piece, you know, how, how do you prepare for something that you can't listen to? It's interesting. But back to the, the goal of talking about orchestral auditions. Um, and I've, besides the two auditions that I've been on, I've had more experience being on the other side of listening to folks play. Uh, play. And, uh, and so you would say, well, what is it the committee's looking for? The goal of uh, the auditioner is to listen for a few things. And one of those things is sound. We're li always listening for full, beautiful, great, good sound. That is what wins the day. Sound wins at all times. Uh, can the applicant uh, color their sound? Is their sound consistent? 
uh, and even through the ranges. Uh, can he color the sound using uh, brights? Uh, I used to refer to the sound that, that I love listening to Bud Herseth play. He could sound like a hot knife through butter. And at other times, he could sound like thick cream. And, uh, and I, and, but whatever he was doing, whatever the, whatever the, uh, whatever the expression that he was using, sound was always the focal point. The other thing that the committee is lis listening for and looking for is rhythm. Does the applicant understand good rhythm? Now, I would use the word strict rhythm. Can they be, uh, and then on counter to that, can they be soloistic in their interpretation? And the third aspect of that is can they adapt? So I would want to play something generally. I, at some point in the audition, it's going to be required of me to play something in strict rhythm. You can imagine playing that in bad rhythm. The poor snare drummer, he'd be whacking you over the head with a stick. Uh, you know, he's not going to want to do that. It's, it wants to be in good rhythm. So the, uh, so the audition committee is going to want to hear that. But at the other times, they're going to want to hear how, how soloistic can you be. So you want to demonstrate that. And they, will, uh, at, they possibly will ask you to do something differently. And I always took that as them just trying to see how pliable I was. And, uh, and so I need them to be able to adapt upon the request. So good sound, rhythm, intonation. Does the applicant have good self-intonation from top to bottom? Are they in tune with themselves? Or is it one of those kind of weird scales where you just can't seem to find where they're going? Are they aware of the proclivities? I love that word. Are they aware of the proclivities of their instrument? Do they know that the G on the top of the staff is going to go sharp? And can they hear that, or are they just going to play it and you're just going to have to deal with it as a listener? Uh, no, you, you want to hear that they're making adjustments as they're, as they're playing through that scale. And uh, again, the same question comes, can they adapt upon request? I'll tell you a little story here. One of my one of one of my auditions uh, at the New York Philharmonic, um, the, the audition had gone on all day. It had been, we'd been back and forth and back and forth. It came down to a couple of us and we were passing each other on and off the stage to go out and play lick after lick after lick. It was not pleasant. It, there was nothing nice about this. But I remember as I walked out there after the day was almost done and I was asked for the umpteenth time to play the opening of Zarathustra. And uh, as I was getting ready to play, uh, someone in the committee, who will remain nameless, um, said to me, um, the high C sounds a little flat. Can you make it a little sharper? And I thought, well, what a strange request. If anything, I would think I'd be going sharp. So they were thinking it was flat. So obviously, I'm doing too good a job. But that was, uh, <laughs> that, that was the mindset, although I was getting a little ticked off that this was now going to be the umpteenth time of playing it. So I proceeded to play ba ba bum. I played the whole intro, of course, and then ba ba bum, 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 bum. <laughs> and I cut off and I said in a very angry voice, is that sharp enough? At which case, James Chambers, who was the proctor at that time, said to me, shh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know. So that was, uh, maybe that was my first trumpet head coming out, a little bit of the aggression. That, maybe that won me the job. I don't know. <laughs> said, yeah, as a New Yorker. All right. Um, but uh, musical awareness, uh, and can they adapt on request? So that's what we're looking for on that side of the screen. Uh, so how do you prepare? That's the thing. Well, Scripture, you know I'm a man of faith, and I always like going to the, the good book, and Scripture says that we are made up of body, mind, and spirit. In today's world, we don't like talking about the spirit part too much. That's kind of not PC. We'll talk about the body a whole lot. <laughs> and we'll talk about the mind, uh, Yeah, like, uh, boy, we can do all kinds of things with our mind, but we don't talk about the spirit. But scripture does say that as individuals, that's who we are. 
We are body. If you're preparing for an audition, you need to treat your body right. I am not the fittest man in the world. <laughs> I get that. Uh, but uh, it doesn't hurt to get regular exercise. It doesn't hurt to get regular sleep patterns. It doesn't hurt to eat healthy. Those are all things that need to be done. It doesn't hurt to drink plenty of uh, water. Maybe cut back on the caffeine a little bit. And so just to treat yourself, your body, well. Um, I know Joe Alessi goes, when he is preparing for a solo or something like that, uh, you'll notice that a solo's coming up for Joe because he just trims down. It's just like, man. It, and, and you say, Joe, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm swimming. I'm swimming laps. I'm doing this. And he really, it, he takes that part very, very seriously. Uh, we're body. We're also mind. Listen. Practice. Imagine, believe, read, be humble and quiet. Uh, what does that mean? Listen. What do you think it means? It means listen. Go out and get some CDs. Listen. Practice. It's no good to say, you know, I can't get the high C if you don't practice the high C. Again, we heard about that with Rex when he was giving his uh, class. If you work on your double time, if you need a better double time, you've got to work on your double time. Uh, imagine, well, we heard about that in that discussion as well for that uh, Tony spoke a little bit about, about, uh, about believing and, and, and that. Imagine yourself, see yourself as a victor, uh, believing, believing that you can accomplish this. I got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Uh, that's the kind of attitude that you have to come into. Perhaps read of the struggles and the victories of others. Uh, again, I go to scripture for that, but you can read about that on lots of different levels um, of people who have conquered. I love the story of little David. Who would have thought that somebody would have walked out, this little shepherd boy would have walked out to face King Kong, Goliath, standing there with all of his armor with a slingshot and five stones. And yet little David, he had practiced. He had killed a few bear in his day. Um, and he imagined, and he believed, and he, it, he saw the victory that was there to be had. And he was of humble and quiet mind. And he was able to put that stone in there when everybody was laughing at him, and he was able to go, and his, his Goliath went down. So your, your addition may be the Goliath that you're facing, but that's what you have to do. Body, mind, spirit. Keep calm. I know that's easy to say. It's easy to write down. Keep calm. I get it. Uh, I've been there. Uh, your spirit can be secure if you know you've prepared as best you can. So that does mean that you've got to do all those other things. You've got your body, you have to do that. You have to have done that. Your mind, you have to have listened. You have to have practice. You have to have done that. But that will all contribute to your spirit to keep calm. If you can't get the high C in the basement, it ain't coming out on the stage, you know? Now, I believe in miracles. <laughs> and I've had a few in my day. Dear Lord, help me get this one. Oh. But, uh, you know, but, but you, can't, you, you can't count on that. Don't, that's not the way to, to, to travel through life. You've got to prepare as best you can. You can only do your best today. If you're successful, great. If not, there'll be another time, and you will have learned and gained so much from this experience. Of all who try, only a small group move on, and only one wins. Maybe. <laughs> uh, find the success in what you do. Be realistic with yourself rather than being negative. In the immortal words of Winston Churchill, never, never give up. <laughs> right? That's what has to happen. Um, which leads me a little bit to the path that I've been on. Uh, some of you may know that in uh, the end of 2013, I got diagnosed with dystonia. And it's ugly. I don't wish that on my best friend. Um, has not been a pleasant journey. Um, when, um, 
it was interesting to hear this morning the reference made to riding a bicycle. Uh, when you know how to ride a bicycle, um, and when all of a sudden you forgot, I mean, I can still get on a bike and ride a bike. I can't imagine ever forgetting how to ride a bike. But that's what kind of happened to me. Um, now, we can talk about why that is, and, and to be honest with you, having gone through it, I don't really know. Some people say it's uh, a psychological thing. Some people say that it's a neurological thing, and some people say it's a physiological thing. As far as I'm concerned, it's all of those things. Uh, when all of a sudden something that you're doing doesn't work, and you go into this process of working hard and trying to figure it out, um, and through that process it just kind of gets worse to the point of it collapsing, yeah, you got a psychological problem. Uh, when you're not sure if it's coming out, when you never worried about it coming out really before, but now you're not quite sure if it's going to come out, you got a psychological problem. So you got a goulash that you have to unpack. And thank God I found uh, someone in the person of Jan Kagerais who helped me unpack that. And I'm still going through the process of unpacking this little problem and trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. The good news is that you can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. He may be a little scrambled, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but you can't do it. So you have to work on certain things, and we can open up this whole discussion. I'm going down another road, which I didn't really want to go down quite yet, but whatever. The water out. Um, yeah. Now, in November of 2013, I couldn't get anything out. I was going, and nothing was coming out. And I had to be unpacked. I worked really hard. I did all the things that we think by pedagogy we should do. I did them all. I did them all and got worse and worse and worse. And it took someone to take me back and to get me to learn to play just to blow air. Blow air through a big slurpy straw. Blow air through a little straw that got a little smaller, a McDonald's straw. Go to Dunkin' Donuts and get a coffee stir and blow air through there. And you see what I'm doing? I'm working on moving air, but I'm also working on shape. And then start to add that to the horn. And, uh, and I've become a real fan of Bill, Ad uh, Bill Adams. I didn't know anything about Bill Adams before. Um, well, that's not true. But, um, but the whole idea of That's been quite a journey. When that first came out, that was, wow, that was kind of cool. Because I had gotten note to this. I figured what the way dystonia worked for me is that I started off with an air leak. And for a couple of years before I got hit with this, I just had this air leak. And I thought, well, this is kind of odd. I'm kind of getting fat and out of shape. Maybe this is getting fat and out of shape. So I better start. <laughs> I better start doing more buzzing. And I buzz, and I buzz, and I buzz, and man, I held pencils with my little this. I did everything I could. And all I was doing was adding tension, and tension, and tension, and tension, to the point that at some point, it just gave out. My mind said, Smith, that's not how you play the trumpet. That's not how you ride the bike. And my mind just went, boink. And then this thing started going, boink. And everything went nuts. And I had to go back. As Jan said, she said, I'm going to take you on a ride. Anything you think you know about brass pedagogy is going out the window, and you're going to have to trust me. And boy, that was a, that was a, a journey of trust, and still is a journey of trust. Um, but it all, we, we went back to just moving air, moving air, moving air. So I've gotten off on a long journey, and I won't bore you with the rest of my journey. Uh, other than to say, press on, press on, 
press on, press on, be better today than you were yesterday. Don't worry about where you were last year. Uh, we spoke about trying to get to here and then sometimes going back to here. Trust me, I know what going back to here is about. But my goal now is to be better than I was yesterday and to be better tomorrow than I am today. And that's the attitude. That's all part of this mental attitude that goes into what you do as you prepare for an audition. Let me get back to my story here about how to win an audition. So we, start, we spoke about body, mind, and spirit. Um, uh, that's how we prepare. There are other general preparations. We've got a host of things. You got excerpt books, you got scores, you got recordings, you got internet applications such as Spotify, YouTube. Get yourself organized, get a binder, put it all in there. I suggest complete parts, you got IMSLP. I didn't know about this stuff. I came to the University of Georgia and I was so proud I brought my CD collection in. And I said, I said to my kids, I said, you see this? You can come into my studio anytime and listen to this. And, and they went, well, no, we don't do that. We, we have Spotify. I said, Spot who? What the heck is Spotify? And then they showed me, and they showed me that all my recordings are for free on Spotify. <laughs> And that made me angry. <laughs> so angry that I brought them. They're out there. You can go buy them after the class. <laughs> so uh, not, I have to get rid of my product now because it's all for free on Spotify. So uh, anyway, so thanks, Vince. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, uh, but you got it all. You got it all out there. Listen, listen, listen. Be a discerning listener. Be careful to listen to, to the prominent performances of highly respected performers, not the podunk symphonietta. If you go to Spotify, sometimes you'll hear podunk symphonietta. And I'd be careful about listening to that. Make sure you listen to some really good recordings. And don't, you know, as good as some of those old recordings are, you want to listen to something that's a little more current. You know, sometimes the way the old guys played, and I put myself in a car, times change, and we need to, we need to be moving in the time. We need to be there. So I don't necessarily want to play in the same style that I heard somebody great like Voizan or Gatala play. I want to be playing perhaps more in the style of what I'm hearing now. Uh, so th that's, that's a controversial discussion, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, but listen to uh, good groups. When I went to, to audition for the Chicago Symphony, I didn't have this stuff, so I had to go out and buy records. And uh, I got records of Sir George Schulte with the Chicago Symphony. I listened to that, and because I, I thought this is this is the group I want to play with. I want to hear how they play these pieces. I didn't want to just practice the piece. I wanted to hear that piece as performed by Sir George and the Chicago Symphony. And the same when I came to New York. I knew that Zubin was there. I went out and bought recordings of the L.A. Philharmonic with Zubin conducting because uh, Zubin had only come to New York, so we didn't have many recordings of him with New York. But I, I could I could hear what New York sounded like and I could hear what Zubin liked, and I was trying to put those two together. And I was, by that time, I was also representing who I was and where I'd come from, so that was also part of that as well. So no, listen, listen, listen. Let being a musician be the primary guide. There are certain parameters, but what distinguishes is someone who says something musically. The best can say it many ways. Practice spontaneity. We spoke about improvisation. Practice spontaneity. Different shape, dynamic flow. You might discover something that helps your performance. What did Tony say? Practice something musically. If you have a technical problem, practice it musically. You may find an answer through trying to do something musically instead of thinking about the technique of it. Um, at some point, um, I think what you need to do, however, is to settle in. I often say to my kids uh, when they're practicing, you know, it doesn't hurt if, it, if, if some, keeping something there, you know, mm, uh, uh, and hit a high note, mm, um, splia, mm, uh, splia, mm, uh, splia. Uh, why are we doing this? You keep walking around a block and hitting the telephone pole. That's not, it's doing no good. <laughs> so maybe if you're going along and you go, bum, bum, bee, you do something and, 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 you, and you do something musically to help give yourself a little more time to get that note, and you call it style. <laughs> and, uh, 
But what it does is it helps you find a way to get through that. You've, and I'm thinking of pieces like the Brandt, uh, some of those kind of pieces that get, uh, that get a little awkward. You find stylistic ways to get through that. And what that does is that builds up a sense of confidence so that as you perform, you'll actually probably get more to where you were trying to get to in the first place because you've found a way to get through and you'll get through a lot nicer. Be familiar with the context of the piece. Who's the composer? What was the musical period? What's the orchestration? What are the performance practices? All of these things help define your understanding of your sound, your style, your dynamic, and your presentation. Put it in simple English, Beethoven doesn't sound like Brahms. He doesn't sound like Bruckner, and he doesn't sound like Berlioz, and he doesn't sound like Bernstein. All of those are different, different people, different characters, different sounds of what you need to portray on the instrument. So you've got to think about that. Remember to maintain a consistent and well-rounded practice routine. You need to be in the best possible shape to practice at your best as well as audition at your best. That will not be the case if you spend too much time just practicing excerpts. A general rule of thumb for me might be to practice the excerpts in an ever-increasing percentage of time, but no more than 60 to 75 percent of the time. As I was getting closer to an audition, I would be focusing more on that. But if you are just an excerpt player, you are not a musician. And you're not even a good trumpet player. You're just a lick learner, excerpt player. Um, and and there's, there's more to life than doing that. Um, Obviously, you're gearing up to do that at this moment on the stage, but you have to do so much more. And if, you're, if, if you've practiced your fundamentals, if you've practiced your studies and your solos, and you're just working as a musician, when you come at that moment to have to produce that, you'll be in far better shape than if you just practice excerpts. So that's the general practice routines. Spe specific preparation. Um, when it comes to, say, we're going to go out and here's the list and we have to play the Haydn Trumpet Concerto, uh, treat the usually expected solo as your time to be you. You're not just warming up and you're not getting used to the hall or wasting time. You're now the soloist. Say something. Sing, sing, sing. The time when they, they give you the time to be performing, they want to see you in your most individualistic, self-confident, musical self. That's what we're looking to hear. Remember that music is the king. Your technique has to serve the music, not the other way around. Your technique has to serve the music, not the other way around. Understand when you play soloistically versus when you must play sectionally. There's a time as a performer to be a soloist as I would be if I was playing the Haydn, but there's also a time to be a, uh, a section player. For instance, the first time I play that in the orchestra, I'm playing it by myself. I can be the matador. I can be, I can do that. <laughs> but the next time, also, I got horns and other folks playing with me. And if I'm trying to be the matador, they're going to be sitting up there wondering where the heck I went. So there are times when I have to be aware of when I can add a little bit of style and when I shouldn't, when I have to, when I have to say, troops, here we go, bonk, follow me, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so understand what you're doing at each time. And understand when you're soloistic and when you're a sectional player. Practice at all dynamic levels. You can play that excerpt at all the dynamics from very soft to very loud. Uh, don't just be a mezzo player. Practice at various tempi. <laughs> if you're like me, uh, I would go into an audition playing I would single tongue that because I knew I could count on that. Right? But 
Problem is, as my career went on, these young pianists came in here. <laughs> And the tempo of that lit got quicker and quicker and quicker. It's like, good grief, what the heck is going on here? So in an audition situation, you may be able to get away with doing where you're comfortable, and I think that's probably a wise thing to do. But even in that situation, you really should be prepared because there may be some idiot like me sitting on the other side says, do you mind playing that again and playing it a little quicker? Uh, so you want to be prepared. You have to know how to get through these. But practice things at different tempo because things are going to come at you at different tempos and you need to be aware of how to work through that. One of my favorite things, um, when we were recording in, in the old days, we used to have, uh, make records of, uh, we used to have radiothons to raise money for orchestras, and they would make a special recording that you could pay 150 bucks for, you know, it was only worth five, but you pay 150 bucks to raise the money. And one of the ones we did with Chicago Symphony was they had uh, all the different recordings that Adolf Herseth had made of Promenade. Uh, pictures at an exhibition, the promenade. And, and it's, it was a wonderful thing to have because you heard, um, you heard renditions like bom, 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 bing, bom, bing, that was with uh, Giuliani. Bom, bom, bing, bom, bing, bom. And then you heard the, uh, the Kublik one. Bom, 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 bom. And you heard the Schulte one. Bom, 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 bom. And all these different versions that had to go on. And it was just a revelation to me that the same trumpet player was playing it, but he had to play it in all these different, different ways to play it. So practice in all the various different tempi. Um, make sure that you understand the difference of rhythm. Dotted eighths and sixteenths are not triplets. No, 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 no. My kids are going, oh gosh, here he goes again. Smith talking about rhythm. And that's not the same as dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, or dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. Because he could have written dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. So if he wrote da, da dum, it's da, 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 da dum, you know? Felt like Victor Borger there for a minute. Yeah. So there's a difference between how you play those dotted eighths and sixteenths. They're not triplets, and some of them are, are sixteenths with an eighth note rest, and a sixteenth, and some of them are an eighth note with a, uh, <laughs> I'm getting myself screwed up here, eighth note with a sixteenth note rest with a sixteenth note. Uh, it, it, you, you have to know what those different things are. One of the things I loved about Mr. Herseth when you heard him play, you knew exactly what was on the part. If a piece went by and the first time the lick ended in an eighth note, and the second time that same lick ended in a quarter note, you heard the difference. You heard an eighth note and you heard a quarter note. And if that eighth note had a line over the top, that was different than if an eighth note had a over the top. And, uh, and he just made an art out of playing everything that was on the page, but making it sound musical. And that was, uh, that's something that I noticed and I wanted to do. Use a metronome to make sure that the steady excerpts remain steady to keep track of a consistent tempo. Repeated use will burn the good info into your brain. If you use a metronome enough, and this goes for solo practice, if you use a metronome enough, when you get out there, you can pretty well guarantee that without it, you're going to hit the tempo that you want because you burned that tempo into your being. <clears throat> That's the tempo I want for that lick. That's how fast I want to go. So use a metronome. Practice with that metronome. Having trouble with the excerpt? Sing it. Write it out. Change the rhythm. We mentioned Rob Roy McGregor's book. Change the rhythm. Break it into smaller units. When I would get Petrushka, I hated that excerpt. But you would hear me practice. Ask my wife. You'd hear me practice. You get the idea? I'm going to add, I broke that into over and over and over. And that makes it when you come time to play, you've done it in every possibility. And now when you just play the thing, it's a piece of cake. Almost. Um, so, uh, practice in time. 
Uh, do your best in your practice time to be quietly critical rather than loudly conversational. That's important. Write that down. That's really good. Do your best in your practice time to be quietly critical rather than loudly conversational. Taping can be good, but in reality, you must perform to your Gabriel while listening to yourself, while realizing what is going on, while not becoming distracted or conversational, but remembering what to address the next time. Now, I'm, I, I used the, the word Gabriel there. I'm actually stealing that because I remember Vince Panzarella talking about Gabriel. We all have to have a Gabriel up here. That's who we want to sound like. That could be, you pick your name. I'm playing this piece, and I want to sound like, and that's your Gabriel. That's who I'm going to. That's exactly who I'm going to. And I want to be quietly critical. I want to be quietly critical. I want to hear what I'm doing, but I want to be getting myself moving towards Gabriel rather than hearing what I'm doing and going, oh, boy, that was garbage. Oh, that stunk. Oh, man, that was horrible. That was because at that point I'm being loudly conversational. And all I'm doing is bringing negative into what I'm doing. I want to be constantly moving to something that's better, constantly going to something that's better. All right, so that's kind of where I'm going. That's how I'm preparing. During the last week at the audition, practice your audition. Practice multiple times in a day. Play a 20 to 30 minute audition of the expected licks in random order. Odds, evens, every three or four, up or down the list, big horn, small horn, mix it in whatever way, play something a second time, slower, faster, louder, softer, just in case they ask you. Play that awkward note flatter or sharper, just in case you ask you. You'll be ready for anything. Check out and you go at it in every way you can. Assuming that you've prepped well, don't overplay the day before the audition. It's too late. The day before is like, it's too late, you may as well not go if you're, real, if you're really feeling bad about it. Uh, the day before, back off. At the audition, be focused. Be focused. Pew. Be friendly, but avoid conversation and socializing. Well, this is Smith talking. This is what I had to do. Some of us are different, so I, I'm just telling you what I had to do. I wanted to be friendly, but I didn't want to be, I wanted to avoid conversation. Because you're there to play your best. You don't need sight games. Some people like to play sight games, let's face it. There'll always be those who try to intimidate you. I remember going into an audition once, and there was somebody, we were all in this cattle call room, and there was someone over here, and he was playing up and down and up and down and whacking the high notes. Man, I heard more high C's, than, and I was thinking, shoot, I hope I can get a high C. <laughs> but there's sight games that go on in those things. And I'd rather just be left alone and just focus in, focus on what I've got to do, go at it that way, and not, and, and, you know, not allow someone to come up and kind of put me on a defensive and, and talk me back into a corner, but just I'll, I'm there to do my best. I learned this lesson. Don't clean oil or grease anything on your instrument on the days prior. Don't do that because something's going to go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember playing once on my, I uh, had a piccolo trumpet solo to play, and I decided right before I went out on stage that my, my, I had a little trigger on my first valve. It needed to be just a little more grease on there. And when I got out there, and I guess just with the lights and with the heat of my body and the pressure, that grease melted, and before I knew I was doing this lovely trill, and my first valve went down and went, and it's like, <laughs> and I'm trying to go like this, and I'm going to go, and, it's not, and I had to literally leave the stage and go off and just like pour a bottle of valve oil on this thing to get it to loosen up so I could go back and play the rest of the piece. What an embarrassment. That was horrible. So don't do that, you know. <laughs> clean your horn a month before, then leave it alone, <laughs> you know. I would say clean it because I've seen some horns that are size small when they should be extra large. You know. <laughs> get my point. Um, when you go on stage, when you go on stage to perform a piece, a solo, or in, a, in an audition, listen in your mind to the recordings of your Gabriel. You need to be hearing, I would go out and I would say, I want to sound like Bud Herseth. I could hear, I could hear him playing that. And in my mind, that's what I was doing. I was going to sound like him. 
And that's what I was doing. I had Gabriel in my mind. And I was hearing the orchestra, because I listened and listened to those excerpts over and over again, but with the orchestra. And so as I was coming up, I could hear, and I could hear the rhythm of that, and I could hear, the piece had started three bars earlier, and I, was, I could hear the drum going along. I didn't just go out there and go, here goes. What? Da -da -dum. No, no. <laughs> be in the game. Be in the game. Our old friend loved that. Uh, the, the, some of the vocalises that we do, it's amazing if you look at some of them, how they, there'll be a bar or some beats rest before you ever play. Well, some of them, it's that they had accompaniments that were written for them. But I also think part of that is, it's just to get yourself to be thinking time before you come in. And that's the way to do it. Uh, Carmen Caruso, what he has this thing about when, he, when he's about tapping the foot, right? Part of that is you hear it as you come in. You join the game. Um, now, this is an awkward one, but I'm going to say it anyway when you go to an audition. Dress appropriately. Appearance is important. You need to look as professional as you want to sound. I can remember seeing one young man come to the Philharmonic, and he had a baseball hat on, T-shirt, and torn jeans. He hadn't played a note. He was done. Because those of us in the committee, you may say this is unfair, but we thought if that's what you think about us, then we don't really want to know what you think about the job you're about to do. So dress appropriately. I'm wearing the colors for a reason, because I'm proud to be a Georgia Bulldog. So this is appropriate dress for what I'm doing today. <laughs> um, uh, play in the present. Don't worry about what's coming, and don't worry about what happened. You can't change what happened, and what's coming may never get there, so just be here. Be here and, and do what you're doing now. If you're asked to do something again in a certain way, don't panic. Do it. If asked to play in a duet or a section setting, understand your role and do it. Are you the principal? then lead. But what about the other principles? If I'm, maybe if it's just me and the second trumpet, if I'm the principal, lead. But now I'm playing in a brass section, what about the other guys? Well, I better be paying attention to my first trombone and my first horn here. Make sure that I'm working in this team. It becomes that. Am I the second player? Don't lead. Don't lead. Listen to the first player. Follow. Be a glove. Be there. Be, so be aware of what you're doing. Uh, go for it. Now is the time. Sing, baby, sing. When you pick up the horn, you're going for it. It's not time to be thinking about, geez, I hope this note comes out. That's not the time. You want to pick up the horn? You want to know that first note is coming out. You want it? I heard it. I knew exactly what was there. And I, I could hear it. And I took my breath. Relaxed as I could be, and I was ready to go. You could have knocked the horn away from me at the last minute because I wasn't pressing. There was no tension. I could know exactly what's going on. And there was the note. That's exactly what's going on. I could do that up there. It's the same thing. It's all right. It's a little harder down here for me right now, but it's still there. All right. <laughs> so that's the idea. It's, it's ready to go. Go at it at all times. Ready? So that's my audition preparation time. I don't want to bug you with the rest of my thoughts, but I thought I'd get that over with. How much time do we have left? <clears throat> We've got a few minutes. I'm going to open up the floor for you. Any questions, anything you'd like me to talk about? It can be about audition prep. It could be about my career as an, or an orchestral musician. It can be about my struggle. It can be about dating. It can be about marriage. <laughs> um, I'm happy to talk about all those things. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's a good question. Did I ever get jaded? Um, the, truth, the truthful answer is yes. The truthful answer is, oh, man, I can't believe we're playing Mala Fifth again this year. And, um, that quickly passes, though, because what happens is that you know that the people are showing up to hear it tomorrow night, 
they want it, they want to hear it good. And so, so jadedness has to, that's just the human condition, we, you know. Uh, and, and you just have to say, you have to fight by that. You have to say, no, I'm not going to be jaded. I'm going to give this my best shot. I'm going to prepare it as best I can. Um, your goal is to do the job and do it to the best of its ability. So you have to kind of leave that there. You, you just have to work through it, work by it. So yeah, did I get jaded? Yes. Are musicians jaded? Are we a jaded lot? lot? Yes. What do we do? So we sit downstairs in the, in the club room beforehand and, we're, and we're, we're, we're jaded about the job we're doing and all of this. Let me tell you from the persp my perspective now, I miss the orchestra. I miss it immensely. Um, I'm where I'm at now because it's the right time and God has taken me there at that time. And, you know, things are right. But I, in my situation, I couldn't go back and play right now. I'm not in that uh, ability to play, but I miss it. So don't become so jaded because when it's finally taken away, you will discover that you probably, what was jaded will become the thing that you long for. So just kind of keep that in perspective. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, no, it, 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 I guess the first part is, was there a difference in those days? Yes. Why was that? Probably because we were more individualistic. We weren't as globalized as we are now. Everybody hears the same thing. We've gotten to this, this thing where, you know, um, um, we, we, it's a smaller world. The world has shrunk down. The, the recordings, we can go on Spotify and hear all of this. And, and it is, it's gotten all very, very small. Um, so that's just a recognition of that is the fact. Uh, the second thing is, yes, can you add, what do you do then with your voice? How do you present yourself? And I, th I think you've got to think about that like, um, I think an American trumpet player, someone who's brought up in this country, if we were to go and audition in Germany, say, we probably wouldn't, th there still is enough of a separation that we might not fit into their concept of sound and vice versa. Um, and yet, having said that, there is sort of a general American concept of sound that is, that is there, um, rightly or wrongly so. Um, and I think we have to be aware of that. We have to sort of play into that. I've often said to kids, you, first of all, you've got to get the job. When you get the job, now if you want to add a little bit of your flavor and your taste to something, you can. And that comes also with time. As a young first trumpet player, I went out of my way to do everything that I thought needed to be done to satisfy the boss up there. I felt a little more comfortable as I got into the back end of my, my time. They actually left me alone. They didn't feel they had to teach me quite so much. And, uh, and it, it gave me room to be a bit more Phil Smith. I was able to give more of what I thought. At the same time, you've got to be then able to, to pull back and do what they, what they may ask you to do. So it's, it is a, it's a hard discussion. Um, but uh, I, think there's, I think there's room to sort of fit into the global thing to some extent. And then there's also room to open it out. 
I still think there is a difference. I think if you listen to some of the great young trumpet players in the orchestral world today, you'll hear a difference between a Dave Bilger and a Tom Hooten and a Chris Martin and a Tom Rolfs and a Mike Sachs. There's still some difference there, but it is on a smaller scale, I'll admit that. Um, so anyway, yeah. Yes? Oh man, there there are so many uh, ex inspiring. You know, I played in the orchestra for 36 years. That's there's more experiences than I can give you. But uh, there were just there, there were great experiences. There were funny experiences. There were tragic experiences. Obviously, uh, our, our after 9/11, the concert that we gave there with the Philharmonic was just oh that was that was something. Um, there are, there are tons of great experiences, and can I name one? I can't really, <laughs> so sorry, I'm not really good at, at, at that kind of stuff, but uh, there are great, there are funny, ex funny experiences. I love the different composers. I'll tell you one, um, as a young guy, my first tour was with uh, Lenny Bernstein. We went to Japan, and we were doing Shostakovich Fifth, and uh, I never knew quite what to make of Lenny. He was a little bit too overt for me. Um, I was, uh, um, and just the fact that the boss wanted me to call him Lenny was kind of weird in and of itself. I had always been brought up to Mr. This and Miss That, and you know. Uh, but I remember uh, I got into the elevator at the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo and uh, pushed my floor and you know was waiting for the doors to do this, but. They hadn't done that yet, and I see this commotion, and in is coming this Lenny Bernstein in a little, little guy, he was, he's a little guy, wearing a black cape that, that had red inside, so it kind of flashed red, and he had his black hat on, and, and there were all of these entourage of people coming in behind him, and, I, and they were headed right for the elevator, and I was like, come on, Doors, please, please. <laughs> and, uh, Sure enough, the doors didn't close, and in comes Lenny Bernstein, and the entourage stayed out, and the doors went like this. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he says, and he came up to me, and he grabbed my cheek, and he goes, there's my little first trumpet player. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, golly. But I, I grew to love the man, and he was a great man. And to follow that up then, because cause he, was, he, he was bigger than life, but he was a wonderful guy. And, and, uh, and I remember then taking, a few years later, we, the Philharmonic Brass Quintet did a joint concert with uh, the Canadian Brass and the BSO Brass up at Tanglewood. And I took the family up there, and my kids were probably, I don't know, they were probably seven and, I don't know, seven and five, something like that. And, um, and we went into the shed, and Lenny Bernstein had just finished conducting the, the kids uh, in, a, in a piece. And, and I said to my wife, and I said, let's go up, and I'll introduce you to the maestro. And so, th and so the rehearsal's over, and I took her up. And, of course, he's sweating. It's the summer, and he's all wet. And, I said, my show, I said, oh, Phil, and I said, I'd love to introduce you to my wife, and he was very gracious standing on the podium, hi, Sheila, and he, he shook hands with Sheila, and I, I said, and this is my son, Brian, he was about seven, and, he, and he, he reached down and he gave Brian, Brian, so glad to meet you, and he was very friendly, and I said, and this is my daughter, Erica, and Erica was about five, and, and he came off the podium, and he bent down, and he, and he said, Erica, and he gave her a big hug, and he was all gooey. And, <laughs> and, and as he stepped away, because Erica just says what's on her mind, she always has, and as she stepped away, she went, yuck! <laughs> uh, and I thought, man, and I could see pink slip, I could see that was it. And, uh, but he laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed, and, and we got Christmas cards from the Bernstein family every year. And it was just, he loved kids, and he was so friendly. He was an interesting man, to say the least. And, um, meant, but as, uh, he, there was also something really, and so it was neat. It was neat in so many ways to get to meet some of these greats and to see them as people. So, yeah. Anything else? Uh, you have any insights about the prevention of injuries in the law? 
the prevention of injuries in the long term. Good grief. <laughs> uh, no, I've had, a, I've had my share. I, I did get a hernia once. Um, that wasn't pleasant. And how do you, how do you, man, I guess basically going back to what I was saying about just making sure that your body, mind, and spirit, uh, that, you're, that you keep, I mean, let's play it. Trumpet playing is a physical thing. And, and uh, so I think you've got to, and, and in that regard, then practice, that's all part of the thing, but just treating yourself kindly, uh, being well rested, all of those kind of things. Um, no, I don't really have a, a whole lot of how to do that. Obviously, I guess it goes back to how do I play? Am I a tense player? Um, things are going to happen. I mean, I got a hernia once, which was, as it turned out, it was an umbilical hernia, and it was something I was born with. Most babies, it, if a baby has a hernia, it's usually an umbilical hernia, and mine was that. Um, and it just chose that time to let go. It should have happened decades ago, but it didn't. And uh, uh, so I never had a hernia that was, I don't think, as a result of playing, but um, so I, I think my general impression would be to say to you, you've got to play as relaxed as you can. Any kind of tension that you bring into, into the playing is no good. So uh, any kind of tension, whether that's holding the horn, do you hold the horn with a death grip? You know, do you have that kind of grip on the horn? Or are you holding the horn kind of loosely? Is your right hand kind of loose? That's, uh, I would start there. Are you, are you fairly loose up here, or are you in this kind of caveman kind of oh, bent, bent over that? And, and your breathing, your breathing should be very, very easy, in, out, in, there should be no, I, I'm not, forgive me if I say something that's not right, but I'm not, I, I want to be very careful when I talk about breathing. To me, breathing should be as relaxed and as easy as it can be. Sometimes we get into different programs to work on our breathing that, in essence, create tension. Uh, fight and flight, right? If you're walking down a dark alley and someone pops out at you, your reaction is to go <gasps> and <coughs> when you do that, it brings tension into your body. So I like my breathing to be rather slow. I like to be relaxed, as, you, as I mentioned, being able to knock the horn away before I let go. Uh, that initial articulation should be like me coming and kissing my wife. If, if I take a breath and I'm already pressed in, that's, that's, there's nothing good. So th those are all things that contribute to tension in the playing. And so I, I want to be that. It, as far, now you can get into volume. Accidents or, or issues because of volume. Should I be playing everything as loud as I can? No, play, play where you're comfortable. I would always advise someone to play where, to play in your best sound, not play where you think it ought to be. If, you're, if your best sound is then you don't want to play. And a couple of things happened there. I played loud, but I also, you could hear my, my lips went, you know. It wasn't. a vibrant, open kind of feel and sound. That's what I'm trying to get at. Um, so things like that. I don't know, does that answer your question in that, in that way? That was a hard question. Um, going back to your Gabriel novel, do you, is it always a fictional, or is it sometimes a fictional character, or is it always people? And then also, uh, as your roles change over the past couple of years, I'm assuming you're, you're teaching more solo rep, uh, chamber rep, and etudes and whatnot. Do you, Oh, it, 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 Gabriel's, yeah, Gabriel can be specific. It, you know, I want to play, the, I want to sound like Bud Hurst here. I want to sound like Maurice Andre there. I want to sound like Winton there. I want to sound like Rex there. I want to sound, you know, whatever that is. That they can be that. It can also be just what I want to do. It can be a nebulous Gabriel. But for me, it's usually tied in with a person because that's, I've been listening and going, wow, I really liked that then and that there. Uh, and does the list change? Yeah. Uh, you know, my list can be old, it can be the Bud Hurses and the Maurice Andres, 
uh, but it can be the Allison Balsams and it can be the, you know, whoever the latest, greatest folk are. And those are all good things, I think. Um, time does change, you know. It's how many, let me just ask this. How many people have heard a recording of Maurice Andre lately? Oh, that's great. I, was, I, I actually thought it was going to be less. How about Jerry Schwartz? Yeah, see, we, it, it, it's, it, it's interesting some of that. How about Tom Stevens? Yeah, see, it's kind of interesting. As, as generations move on, how about, um, how about Vacchiano? Yeah, see, it's interesting. Now we get, you know, you can keep going back. You can get back to uh, to how many people have heard recordings of Toscanini in the Philharmonic? A few, yeah, a few more of those. So it, it, it's interesting. Some of those Gabriels will change as time goes on. And that just, that's the human condition. That's what it is. Yeah. What was your least favorite part of your orchestra job? The least favorite part, getting to work <laughs> in New York. <laughs> getting to work was a problem. No, I guess the least favorite part is just the expectation that Um, but the fact that it had to be as good, people didn't care if I was such and such an age. They didn't care if, you know, they wanted to come and hear Mahler's Fifth when I was 60, as good as it had been when I was 25. And that was, that was a challenge. Uh, I wouldn't say that was my least favorite thing, but that was just, that was an unfavorite thing. Um, um, I'm not sure what my least favorite thing was. That's a good question, too. Well, you're asking some good questions. Um, the, 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 the re repetitiveness of it, that, that was a part that would get to be like, why are we doing Mala 5 yet again when we could have done something else that we haven't done? Um, yeah, those are kind of things. It's the political things that go on, there's politics and everything, you know. Uh, some of the relational things that you've got to be careful about in, in orchestras, you can, uh, those, those are things that are unpleasant. And my goal was always, I, I hated to hear stories of this person didn't speak to that person, and this person didn't speak to that person. And it was like, it, it, we, sh we got to be bigger than that. Music has got to be, a it, 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 we can't be that shallow. Uh, we got to learn to get along with each other. So those are things that are, I think are important. Oh, singers, yeah. I mean, a lot, I love, I, I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I love listening to someone like a Frank Sinatra, you know, and just and his expression of a song, and, you know, the different, and, and, the, and uh, I love listening to Karen Carpenter, her, the beauty that she sang. I love listening to uh, um, uh, Barbara Streisand. Hate her politics, but love her singing. <laughs> uh, you know, but, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of folk like that that just... Uh, a lot of a lot of singers that I like like that. Uh, other wind players like I loved man when I first came into the Philharmonic, and would listen to Julie Baker on flute play, and just think, wow, man, if I could make my trumpet sound like that. Um, hearing the technique of someone on a fiddle doing some Paganini or something, and go, man, that, wouldn't that be cool if I could do that on a trumpet? Things like that. Yeah. Yes, sir. How did I develop my sound? I think my sound came from things that I liked. Again, influences that I heard. I mean, obviously, a big one for me was my dad. I heard his sound. And in fact, if you go and listen to some recordings of he and I playing together, you're hard pressed to find out who's who. Because as a kid, I was just trying to play like my dad. And a lot of my lessons with my dad were oral. He, he played in my lessons all the time. It's one of the things that I wish I could do more now, but because of my situation, I can't play as much as I, as I would like to. Um, so I relegate to, to singing and trying to s express things in, in a singing way. 
Um, so that, that all was a part of how my sound became that, listening to good players and wanting to sound like that, or as I said, singers, how someone colors the sound. How does Frank Sinatra or, or Karen Carpenter color their sound? How they can start with a note that's pure and then add a vibrato in it and take that out or something like that. Um, what do I do with, with uh, folk that are doing that? Usually if sound is bad, it has to do with tension and it has to do with lack of airflow. And the more relaxed I can be and the better the airflow through the horn, the better the sound will become. And usually we can hear that. I mean, you can, you know, if I just say to someone, what do you think of the sound of that? And most, most people, if they're honest, they kind of go, well, I didn't like that. Well, so make it sound better. And a lot of that is what you have to do to make it sound better. It's, it's not, it's, it's finding that balance point. You have to find what it is. You have to learn, because we're all different. We've got different teeth, different body structures. The way, the way we function is different. And you have to find where that is. And then for me as a teacher, the important part is to go there. That's where, that's, you hear that resonate? You hear that? Do it again. Do it again. Feel that? Can you feel it? Can you hear it? Play into that. That's where you're, that's where you're headed. That's where you're going. So that's my role. Yeah. Anything else up there? I never wanted anything to get in the way of my relationships with my family. Uh, so learn how to say no. Um, understand the balance. Learn how to learn what your family can accept. If me going out and doing tons of solo performances is reflected in stress at home, then then. I don't want to do so many solo performances. I want my home to be secure and sound and comfortable. That's the most important thing to me. So to be able to say no is an important thing. And that's hard. Um, music can be an ego feeder. You've got to be careful of that. Um, your ego can get fed. How many wonderful musicians do you know whose family lives has fallen apart? We all can name that. How many great sports players whose family life has fallen apart? You've got to be careful about the feeding of the ego. Keep it in perspective. Um, understand that your family lasts. This can go away. Sometimes this can go away when you least expect it. And, and your family, be, I'll be very honest with you. I'd be in a mess right now with what I've been through in the last two years if I didn't have um, a relationship with my wife, who's been my biggest cheerleader, that is very, very important to me. And if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be able to be standing here doing this. I would have put this thing away. But she's been the one to say, keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, I'd be in a mess if I didn't have a relationship with somebody bigger than me and my wife, something on a spiritual level. I'd be in a mess if I didn't have that. I want to read to you something that I have here. This little book. My kids have seen this. This little, this little book is my vocal dystonia book. It's sort of a, a little what's gone on. But I have right, right on the beginning of this book, I get every morning at 8.30 on my phone rings uh, a little message from Max Lucado. And it's just a little devotional that comes. And this is one that came right after I'd found out that I had focal dystonia. Well, I just want to read it to you. And this, this, so this is where I'm going. These are the relationships that matter, that take us through. The title of this little, of this little Devotional is called No Easy Solutions. So I'm just reading this to you. It's on page one in my book. I copied it out. Life turns every person upside down. No one escapes unscathed. Not the woman who discovers her husband is in an affair. Not the teenager who discovers a night of romance has resulted in a surprise pregnancy. We'd be foolish to think we're invulnerable. But we'd be just as foolish to think 
evil wins the day. The Bible vibrates with the steady drumbeat of faith. God recycles evil into righteousness. Now, this is Max Licato speaking here. He says, I don't have an easy solution or a magic wand, but I have found something, or rather someone, far better, God himself. When God gets in the middle of life, evil becomes good. Trust God. No, really trust him. He will get you through this. Will it be easy or quick? I hope so, but it seldom is. Yet God will make good out of this mess. That's his job. So that's kind of a real relationship that means something to me. And then it's that earthly relationship, that horizontal relationship with family and that means that they're the cheerleader, cheerleaders when I need it. They're the ones saying, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. You can do it. So that's important. Be careful of the ego. All right, I think uh, we're running out of time, and maybe that's a good place to have left it. I wish you all the best. Uh, it's been wonderful to hear uh, young folk playing, and we're going to hear some more great playing. And uh, thank you very much for coming.